As I was talking, I could hear some grunting in the background, and I look over, and Savvy's little thingy is out, and, uh, Savvy, what were you doing? What were you doing to that girl? Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the vlog. I hope the start of your day is absolutely incredible. You know, we just got three more inches of snow last night, and the reason I'm telling you that is that it's cold in Michigan. About four and a half or five months of the year, it is basically winter, and up until this year, I'm gonna be totally honest with you, I dreaded it my entire adult life. I used to complain the entire time. I hate winter, I hate the cold. I'd wake up and I'd be like, oh, I can't stand it in Michigan, but my family loved it here, so I was stuck here. Well, this year, I turned a new leaf, and I wanna talk to you guys about turning over a new leaf and I decided you know what I am gonna just embrace it I am gonna try to enjoy it you know I can always put more clothes on or a heavier coat on like that's gonna happen but the truth is is that since I took this new attitude I actually have woken up in the morning and said oh my god three more inches of snow it's absolutely beautiful out here and for the first time in my entire adult life, I've actually enjoyed winter. That's right, I woke up in the morning and I haven't been just wishing for spring and summer to come. I've literally embraced every day and actually enjoyed it. Sure, there are times where I'm like, oh my God, it's cold out here. But the truth is, I haven't woke up dreading it. I've actually said, this is pretty awesome. It is so beautiful out here. And it's amazing how different I feel when I wake up in the morning, not thinking, oh my God, three more months until spring. So my point is to you is it's all about the way you perceive things. and if you just go ahead and change your mindset you can absolutely change the way you feel about things and trust me it was the best thing I ever did regardless we are gonna head over to the building today and I am just gonna show you some amazing animals what do you say we get on the road and as always you know I love to read about you guys so do me a favor and go down in the comments and tell me something awesome about you guys what are you doing today you know that I love to interact with you guys and as a matter of fact I'm thinking about doing kind of an all requested animal vlog pretty soon so go down in the comments and let me know what animals you would like me to show in that vlog. As for now, I just want to jump into some really cool animals. You know, I'm going to show you some things that you've seen before. Maybe I'm going to show you some things you haven't ever seen before. But today, I just want to spend time with the animals. So for you guys that just love to see animals and you don't want to see the rest of the stuff, you're going to like this vlog. Let's go ahead and start with this one right here. This is actually a Calabar burrowing python. And these guys are so unusual. I mean, take a look at its head and then take a look at its tail. I mean, they basically look exactly the same. And that's their defense mechanism. These guys will kind of ball up like a ball and you can't tell what the head or the tail is and again as a predator the predators are typically going to go for the head to try to kill the animal and if they accidentally go for the tail this guy may actually survive these guys are from west africa the same exact countries that ball pythons are from and i've been working with these guys for a while i think those are super super neat animals i'll tell you what i think they're one of the most unusual snakes that i work with and certainly way underappreciated if i can ever figure out how to breed these guys and actually get a bunch of captive babies it's going to be absolutely incredible Regards, I think that they're just the most goofy little snakes ever. I show you guys my black tail Kribos all the time, but these are the yellow tail Kribos. It's almost like the color is reversed, right? The black is up on the front and then the tail is nice and yellow, whereas with the black tails, it's kind of the reverse way. Regardless, each of them are pretty similar and they're all in that same dry Marcon family like the indigos. And the fact is, is I can't wait to get these guys next door too because all of my indigo snakes, along with my puffing snakes and mangrove snakes, are going to get really nice, big, natural, and Closures. I'm really excited about it. These guys are what I think of as a very intelligent, inquisitive type of snake. Now, these guys will literally eat other snakes. They'll eat just about anything. And this is the first year that I'm trying to breed the yellow tails. I have bred the black tails in the past, and I hope I have success again this year. But the yellow tails are really gorgeous. I want you guys to meet Sunny. I know I have another Sunny, the Sun Glow Arabesco. But this is actually Eric and Mary's snake. This is actually a lavender albino dwarf reticulated python. Now, it's not a super dwarf so the dwarfs are typically going to stay about you know maybe 10 maybe 11 foot something on that line because of the lavender actually comes from a mainland so every time you breed it into dwarf you're going to get a slightly smaller animal now you might ask what is Sonny doing here right now well those guys have kind of talked me into maybe putting him in with Daisy and seeing if we can get something and I've kind of talked to you guys about not producing a lot of big snakes because I really want to make sure that people that have big snakes are really able to take care of them but I think that the 
fact that these are going to be a little bit smaller, we might still be able to find it. And again, if I do have any luck producing, whether it's from Daisy or Lucy, I will absolutely vet every single person and make sure that they are responsible, have the ability to take care of these guys. And as a matter of fact, I want to tell you guys something. Probably tomorrow, I'm going to check because you know Ricky? Ricky is also a lavender dwarf and he, of course, is adult, you know, about 9 or 10 foot, something in that range. I bought him way back in the day as a male and I've actually had him over the years in with females and he showed no interest whatsoever. So I'm wondering, you know, I've never really resexed that animal and it was like I was telling Eric and Mary, I said, you know, there's a chance that Ricky might be a girl. Again, it's just kind of one of those gut feelings. I'm not 100% sure. So the truth is, is that if Ricky is a female, we'll find out tomorrow when I have some help probing him or her, whatever it may be. The fact is, is that Sonny will probably breed to Ricky if it's a girl and then I won't breed Daisy whatsoever. So regardless, I just wanted you to meet this Sonny who is absolutely gorgeous. And of course, this is our jungle carpet python that produced last year. I mean, just look at how gorgeous she is. I mean, long term, I really would like to work this project a lot more and try to really get the most black and wide yellow bands. I know a bunch of people are doing it and there's so many cool carpet python morphs out there, but to me, there's just something about a really good jungle carpet python with that really rich black and that unbelievably vibrant yellow that just is one of the coolest things ever. You know, so many people have expressed just their excitement with our Blue Tongue Skink project and are always asking like, how did it go, Brian? Well, we're basically almost wrapping up the breeding season now. The vast majority of our females are starting to swell up. I look how chunky she is starting to look. There's a few females that were bred a couple times that I'm still not sure, but the vast majority of the females that we bred are looking really good. So I am so excited. And with any luck, within a couple months, we are gonna have a bunch of little baby Northern Blue Tongue Skinks and maybe even a couple Eastern Blue Tongue Skinks. Regardless, I am so excited. It is such a chunky little monkey and it's gonna be so cute to get little babies. All right guys, so I wanted to update you on one thing that I think is really cool. Take a look at this right here, all right? Now RJ is sitting on that ledge and see how as soon as I walk up, he's kind of a little bit like, should I jump back in the water? So I've been working on him with some hand signals. So basically what I'm doing is I'm just giving him kind of this signal here and that's gonna tell him I'm not gonna mess with you. I'm not gonna put you back. You can stay up there and hang out. And the more that I'm enforcing that, the more he's starting to realize. Let's see if it works. Okay, RJ, don't worry, bud. You can stay. Stay, buddy. Stay. It's okay. Okay. Good job, buddy. And see, this is how you kind of train things like this, is with either verbal or hand signals. And if he realizes that every time I come up and I say either stay or I have the hand out, he realizes I'm not gonna grab him or put him back in the water. After I do that over and over and over again, he stops jumping back in the water to try to avoid me picking him up. And it seems to be working. And I just love the fact that he just hangs out here. Good job, RJ, you're doing really good. Good job, boy, good job. And again, you can reinforce them in a number of ways. One thing if you do a hand or even a noise, and you reward them with food. But another way is just a response, right? So this response is, I'm gonna leave you there to bask on your perch, I'm not gonna mess with you. Now what I don't ever wanna do is give them the hand signal or the stay signal and then go up and grab them or move them because then it confuses them. So if I can continue to do that each time, I can start to really make him understand that I can come up and as long as I'm giving him a hand signal or the stay signal, he knows I'm not gonna mess with him, I'm gonna let him stay right where he is. He is such a cute little dude. Back to carpet pythons. Take a look at this cute little bugger here. This, of course, is an albino Darwin's carpet python. I am absolutely blown away. I've been in love with carpet pythons forever, and I used to work with them so much more than I do now. I am definitely going to start to get back into them to some extent, and it's going to be really nice to have some nice arboreal cages so I can really display some animals and show their true beauty. I mean, look at that thing. That thing is incredible. A lot of people ask me to show love to sand boas, and I've always loved sambos. We show you guys Kenyan sambos, which is understandable because they're the most commonly bred and they have a bunch of color phases and they're absolutely amazing. We certainly show you smooth scales, including the sunsets, but I want to show you a couple other ones that aren't as common. This, of course, is a javelin sambo or an Eryx jaculus. These guys are neat. This is like a sub-adult female right now. They'll get almost the size of a Kenyan sambo and they have live little babies just like the Kenyan sambos and I think they're absolutely adorable. They don't have the orange color that the Kenyans have, but I think that that really kind of reticulated pattern makes them really interesting. Then, of course, there are the rough scale sambos, and of course, they're called rough scale sambos because literally, when you feel them, they have really kind of beady rough scales, and I love that little head. These guys have always been one of my favorite sambos. I literally got my first pair of rough scales when I was like 17 or 18 years old, and I've been working with them ever since. I've had litters that have been 12 or 13 little live babies. Most of the time, they have like six to eight babies, and we have a couple females 
right now that are loaded with babies. They should be dropping anytime. I cannot wait till they have them. I always show you guys so many ball pythons, so I'm gonna try to forego showing a lot of them in this particular vlog, but this happens to be my female spide, which of course is a spider pied, and it's like I've mentioned before, for whatever reason, when you mix the spider in the pied and you get the recessive pied spider, they call them spides, and they only really have pattern on the head, so they're completely white except for their head, and some just have a little cap of color on them, which I think is really cool, but regardless, I'm not gonna show you a bunch of ball pythons. Let me know in the comments if you like to see ball pythons. I just don't wanna bore you with the same thing all the time, but I wanna know if you guys wanna see more of them, I'll do a whole vlog just showing you a ton of cool ball pythons. But for now, before we head upstairs, I have to show you Perdita, and the thing is, I could show you guys Perdita every week because she changes so much every week. Look at all of the speckling she's starting to get, and you can kinda see she's starting to get a little bit opaque again, so she's going back into shed. She's just been eating so good, and she's so amazing, and again, every single week, it seems like she changes. She gets more spots and speckling, and she looks so incredible. Can you imagine this snake when it's 10 or 11 foot long and this big around and in this beautiful display? I mean, this is gonna take a lot of people's breath away, and I bet you a lot of people are gonna change their perception from kind of thinking snakes are scary to thinking they're amazing because of Perdita. It's a little harder to show little baby tiny clubbers and just how beautiful they are in person, but this has always been one of my favorite corn snake morphs. Seems like I say that a lot, but I really do love these guys. These are actually hypo lavender corn snakes. I remember when the first lavender corn snakes were being produced and they really made a big impact on the corn snakes. And then when you bred them into hypo, I mean, they get this really soft pink and lavender look. I mean, they are freaking awesome. And another really shocking colubrid that was really kind of popular, maybe 12 or 15 years ago, to the point where so many people were breeding them, they became really, really cheap. And a lot of people stopped breeding them because it was hard to really get rid of them. And now you hardly ever see them. And that, of course, is this high white banded black and white cow kings. Now I've shown you guys kind of the high white black and white cow kings and albino black and white cow kings that have almost all white on them with hardly any pattern. But the truth is this is where it started. The actual desert phase or black and white cow kings in the wild look like this just with thinner white bands and over years just like we bred polymorphically into those high white aberrant animals you can polymorphically breed the high white bands as well and I absolutely love these guys so I'm hoping it's going to kind of make a resurgence in the coming future and I'm certainly raising some up because I think they're crazy cool. Alright so a minute of Brian's story time for you guys. These snakes right here beautiful white leucistic Texas rat snakes. Let me tell you the story behind these guys. There is actually a legend in the reptile world named Bern Bechtel. Unfortunately he passed away a few years ago and he was quite long in the tooth. He had been around for a long time. He was not only a physician but a termitologist that loved reptiles so he really understood the pigment behind the things because that was his life and he even wrote a book that I absolutely cherish about color variations in reptiles. Well he actually got the very first first leucistic Texas rat, I don't know, 30, 40 years ago, I don't even know when it was, but he literally told me the story in person, and he said he kept it in his bedroom, and he had the leucistic female and a normal male to hopefully produce heterozygous leucistic Texas rats. They bred together, and guess what? She became gravid, and she went to lay her clutch of eggs, and guess what happened? She laid the clutch of eggs in the water dish, and all the eggs except for two perished, and then unfortunately, Unfortunately, the female ended up dying and all he had left were these two eggs that he didn't even know were gonna survive because they were in the water dish and they might drown and the project could have been dead forever but what ended up happening is they hatched out and it was a pair of little baby het leucistic Texas rats. He was able to raise those up, breed them together and guess what? He produced these little guys here. I just love the history behind some of these more. The fact that these beautiful leucistic Texas rats almost didn't get to existence because of a bunch of series of tragedies, but thankfully, Bern Bechtel was able to actually reproduce them. And as a matter of fact, I encourage you to look up Dr. Bechtel and see all his amazing work with reptiles because, you know, as reptile enthusiasts, we really need to understand the people that paved the way for the reptile hobby, and he certainly was a legend. Now that story time is over, I hate to take a break from showing you guys a bunch of stuff, but I, I just have to share this with you. Uh, Savvy here is literally doing something unthinkable to the broom. That's right, as I was talking, I could hear some grunting in the background, and I look over and Savvy's little thingy is out, and uh, Savvy, what were you doing? What were you doing to that broom? Huh? 
<laughs> These male tortoises are absolutely ridiculous, but uh, <laughs> I love the addition of Savvy. He is just such a great animal, and Speedy and him are something else together. That is for sure. So, Savvy, uh, I think that it's time that we get you a girlfriend pretty soon. What do you think? All right, I'm going to finish off this show and tell session with some geckos that we are raising up. Of course, it's been a while since I showed you this guy. This is, of course, Roswell. Remember him? He's the alien-looking huge eye gecko. We're not really going to breed him in the future, but he's just a kind of mascot, and he'll certainly have a cage next door when our mini zoo is open up, and he will probably entertain a lot of people because he looks so unusual. Here's one of our bold bells. I mean, take a look at that bold stripe on that animal. I mean, I think that is amazing, and I love the bold old bell stripe stuff. It's so crazy, but that has some of the thickest, most lavender stripes I've seen. <laughs> that thing is awesome. Over the last few months, we've showed you some of the leopard geckos that are, we call them dark phase because they're just kind of darker. This happens to be a dark hypo with a beautiful carrot tail, and look at the eyes on it. I mean, super, super dark. I mean, I think these are really cool, so we're really trying to still figure the gene out, what it's doing, what it's doing to other things. Uh, so we're raising up a whole bunch of them, but this one is gorgeous. I mean, look at the orange on the tail. I just love that. That really cool contrast and this is just another version of that just with no other genes in it it's just kind of that really dark patterning so there's actually nothing else going on with this one it's basically like a normal leopard gecko just with that dark gene in it and you can see how dark the spots are that's how it influences things and then it changes all kinds of stuff as we get into other morphs and this of course is a total eclipse which is basically the super snow eclipse and for whatever reason when you get the eclipse with the super snow you get a lot of kind of white piding going on and look at it on its face its whole top of its forehead is just nothing but white and then of course you can see the white lines kind of down and the little paws that are all white that thing is awesome this is actually a patty snow white and yellow but just take a look at that animal right there that thing is so freaking awesome I love how it's almost like kind of whitish but it has all this like yellow pattern in it I mean, the thing is freaking cool here's another really cool line that we're working on it's a line bred snow line uh, and that thing is freaking cool I mean they're coming out out better and better because they have that really bold patterning but we're reducing the white every single time that thing is pretty freaking rad and this one right here kind of shows you the polymorphism within that dark line that we're breeding I mean look at this one it has that beautiful dark stripe right down its back and it's got a little bit of lavender hues coming through it and even on the side there's some weird like patterning in its face I mean it's just really cool I cannot wait to see what we do with this gene because it's gonna take us probably two or three more breeding seasons to really figure out what's going on but I'm pretty excited about it and just look Look at the color and pattern on this kind of bold bell type thing, but it doesn't have that really bold stripe like the other one. It's just got that weird back pattern to it, but it is just so colorful and amazing. I love the bell albino stuff, and this one is breathtaking. Woohoo! I tell you what, I'm enjoying myself just looking at all these geckos we're raising up. This is actually an albino Murphy's pattern list, but this is a tremper albino, and it's of course a Murphy's pattern list, which are both recessive, so this would be the double recessive, but not all of them are this bright. This one is really beautiful, and he's got such a character to him as well. And I think I'll go ahead and end my leopard geckos on these ones. You have a bunch of leopard geckos that almost look like little Dalmatians, and I absolutely love these. We have about five or six of them that we're raising up, and we're going to continue to kind of make these things awesome. I want like that solid white leopard gecko that has this beautiful black dotting all over it, and we're getting pretty close on these things. I mean, look at how cool that is. I think this thing is freaking awesome, and that super black eyes. I mean, these personally are my favorite gecko. I mean, so many of them are so incredibly beautiful, but for whatever reason, this is the one that I really get drawn to and I absolutely love them. With that said, I am going to go ahead and end the vlog here. I hope that you guys enjoyed this kind of show and tell day. Every now and then, I just want to show you guys animals because I think that you guys love them and I want to show you what I'm excited about. And again, I hope that you enjoy it. Let me know down in the comments if you do have some animals that you'd like to see so that the next time I do something like this, I can actually use your request and I can show them to you guys. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I hope that you have an amazing day day, evening, morning, whatever it might be. Your support is amazing and I love you guys so much. Can you do me a couple favors before we get out of here? Can you smash that like button as well as turn those post notifications on so you know when I upload a video, which is every day, seven days a week at nine o'clock in the morning, Eastern Standard Time. Remember to be kind to someone and I promise I'm going to see you guys tomorrow.